If you've got a Bible with you, I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter 18. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. I'm going to read you from Matthew 18 and verse 1 down to verse 4. It says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. There's still a child in each of us that has never left our soul. We love their innocence. We love their sense of wonder. We love their sense of spontaneity. We love their joy. Sometimes I think we're too quick to grow out of childhood. We're too quick to rebuke the child within ourselves. We're too quick to tell ourselves and each other it's time to grow up. I think Jesus probably shocked the disciples in Matthew 18. They came to him with a question in verse 1. They said, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? It's a very interesting question. It's a very important question. What makes for greatness where it matters most? What makes somebody great in the eyes of God? What makes them significant in the kingdom of heaven? These issues are all implicit in this question. It wasn't an isolated question. This seems to have been something of a preoccupation with the disciples. Let me read you from Mark chapter 9. When Jesus arrived in Capernaum with his disciples, it says that he said to them, What were you arguing about on the road? Evidently Jesus was a little distant from them, maybe walking ahead, and they were walking behind. They were obviously arguing, a little heated. And it says when he asked them what were you arguing about, they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. In Luke 9 verse 44, Jesus said to his disciples this, in another incident, he said, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them, so they did not grasp it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. Then an argument started among the disciples as to which of them was the greatest. What an amazing context for this argument. He's just told me he's going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They didn't understand it and they argue who of us is the greatest. In Luke 22 on a later occasion in the upper room when Jesus on the night of his arrest, had taken bread and said, this is my body, eat it. He took wine, this represents my blood, drink it in remembrance of me. And then he told them this, so one of you is going to betray me. And this is what it says. It says, they began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. Also a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Isn't that incredible? Can you imagine the crassness of that at such a time as this? He's just told them he's going to die, which he will within 24 hours. He's told them, one of you will betray me. They discuss who's it going to be. And then they move from saying, who, who's, the, who's the worst amongst us, to saying, who's actually the greatest amongst us? And they had a dispute. They were arguing. And, and you can imagine, you can well imagine the dispute was not Peter saying, well, you know, I, I think that uh, the greatest among us is John. I think John's marvelous, and John very bashfully saying, oh, thank you, Peter, that's, that's very kind of you, but no, 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 it's not me. No, I think it's, I think it's Andrew. Remember that time when Jesus fed the crowd with loaves and fish? It was a little boy that came to Andrew. It was Andrew who found him and took him to Jesus. You know, I think Andrew is so tender and kind. I think Andrew's the greatest. And Andrew said, oh, thank you, John, that's, that's generous of you. No, 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 no. If, if, if you, you know, I, I think the last will be first. Remember, Jesus said, the first will be last. I mean, who's the last for Andrew? I think it's probably Thaddeus. I think Thaddeus is probably the greatest. That isn't what they were saying. It was Peter saying, why are we even discussing this? Who's the greatest? It's pretty obvious, isn't it? It's me. 
And John's saying, hey, Peter, you're just a loud mouth. Come on. I mean, it's going to say in the Bible, there's one disciple whom Jesus loved. Who's that? Huh? Yeah, but you're going to write that. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's going to come my gospel. But inspired by the Holy Spirit, he's going to tell me to write, the, not John, write the disciple whom Jesus loved. You know, who, who do you think the greatest? Hey, man, come on. Read the Bible. And Andrew's saying, you two are just a lot of extroverts. I mean, that little kid in that crowd would never have come to you. I mean, he looked for the one who was gentle and kind. I mean, these are qualities that are important. Come on, I think I'll have my day. I'm the greatest. And Thaddeus saying, hey, come on. Yeah, I agree with that verse. The last will be first. I'm the disciple who's going to cause quizzes to lose points because I can't remember the name of the 12th disciple. That's going to be me. So I'm going to, the last will be the first. I'm going to be the greatest. You know, you can imagine that's the kind of discussion that was going on. And all the rest of them, it says, were saying the same. And so here in Matthew 18, when they come to Jesus and they say, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They're probably hoping Jesus will say, Well, let, let me give you, I'll give you the top six anyway, you know, and then you can work out the, the other six. I don't want to humiliate them. I'll give you the top. No, he didn't do that. It says, he called a little child and had him stand among them. Probably just pulled a child out of the crowd. You can be absolutely sure that children hung around Jesus wherever he was. We know that disciples try to drive the kids away. You know, kids read people very quickly. You can be absolutely sure the children read Jesus well. And they hung around and he pulled out this one child and he said to these disciples who wanted to be great, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And that would have shocked his disciples. You see, children in Jesus' day were none entities. If ever the saying was appropriate, and it never has been appropriate, but if ever it was... The saying that says children should be seen but not heard. It's not what childhood is about, by the way. If ever that saying was appropriate, it was in Jesus' day. See, Jesus came into a particular culture at a particular time. doesn't mean he endorsed the culture. and He didn't come in and try to change the culture. He changed people's hearts. And that in turn changed the culture. But in the culture in which Jesus lived, children had little status in Jewish society. Have you ever heard of the miracle of the feeding of the over 10,000? Have you ever heard of that miracle? Well, you know, it says in Matthew 14, verse 21, after what we call the feeding of the 5,000, it says the number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. You see, they only counted the men They didn't count the women. They didn't count the children. It was a patriarchal society dominated by men. The other three Gospels simply say there were 5,000 men. They don't actually even mention that there were women and children there. And the story has come down to us as the feeding of the 5,000. In actual fact, it was the feeding... I don't know if there were equal number of women, that would be 10,000. If they had all their kids with them, that would be, I don't know, 100,000. It's a big crowd. A lot of people. You ever heard of the story of the miracle of the feeding of the over 8,000? Matthew 15, 21, when Jesus fed another large crowd with seven loaves and a few fish, the number of those who ate was 4,000 besides women and children. You see, the women and children were defined in relation to men. And this marginalization of women and marginalization of children adds considerably to the significance of the way Jesus treated women and the way he treated children because Jesus broke the mold on both. And during some of these weeks, I want to look with you at some issues from the Gospels and the theme, how Jesus viewed certain important things. And I want to talk this morning about how Jesus viewed children. Not just what Jesus said about children, 
but by his actions as well, how Jesus viewed children. And I discovered there's a lot more than I have time to talk about this morning. So I want to divide this into two and talk now about how Jesus viewed children. And I'll talk later about how Jesus viewed childlikeness. You see, we are made to think that we are supposed to grow out of childlikeness. We see childhood as a state of immaturity that we want to outgrow and leave behind. And of course, there's truth in that. But the interesting thing is that Jesus says to his disciples here that we are to grow into childlikeness. He says it's unless you change. This is going to involve deliberate, responsible on your part, not to grow out of your childlikeness, but to grow into childlikeness if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven. You know, and here's a great danger for the Christian church, and it's this, that we become too adult, too austere, too regulated, too predictable, too sufficient, whereas greatness in the kingdom involves leaving those behind and going back to childlike humility and dependence and spontaneity and joy and fun. I thought I'd talk about the features of children a little bit. And in so doing, some of the features that enable us to grow in the kingdom of God. I read a book this last week, actually, by Michael Iaconelli called Dangerous Wonder, subtitled The Adventure of Childlike Faith. I recommend it to you. It stimulated my thinking and warmed my heart. And I want to suggest a few things in the world of a child that we do well to recapture in the Christian life. Just a few things, very simple things. First of all, a childlike life is a life of wonder. Wide-eyed wonder is one of the features and joys of childhood. Now, our culture is killing wonder. We know too much. We dissect and analyze everything. We put it under a microscope. We try to describe everything so precisely that there's nothing left for us to have a sense of wonder about. In fact, we've become blasé about the things that should cause wonder. Now, I, I love this universe in which we live, don't you? I, I, it's absolutely mind-boggling. We're just one minute planet orbiting one of billions of stars in our home galaxy, which we call the Milky Way. The Milky Way is about 100,000 light years across. Light travels at 300,000 kilometers a second. That is seven three quarter times around the Earth every second. At, <clears throat> and the distance across our own galaxy is 100,000 light years. We can only see one neighboring galaxy with a naked eye if you know where to look on a very clear night. And that's 2.2 million light years away. It's called Andromeda. But there are, we're told by scientists, and with the last few years, the Hubble telescope has been able to see into far deep corners of space we've never seen into before. And they tell us there are approximately 140 billion galaxies in our universe. If every galaxy was the size of a frozen pea, 140 billion frozen peas would just about fill the ACC, the Air Canada Center would seat 20,000 people. An auditorium seeing 20,000 people is just about the space it would take to put 140 billion frozen peas. And they're all moving further away from each other. You know, if you've got a balloon and you, you paint a few spots on it and then you blow up the balloon and it gets bigger. As it gets bigger, every spot gets further and further away from the other spot. And this, in recent decades, produced the theory of the Big Bang, but what it does tell us is that the universe had a beginning in space as well as time. And you know, sometimes we lose the wonder of the vastness of all of this. You know, when we talk about creation and the universe, we talk about questions like, uh, uh, did it happen in six days? Was it six periods of time? Well, these are important questions, of course, to ask. 
But interestingly, the bigger questions of cosmology are not where did it come, but where is it going, and what is going to happen to our universe. I mean, there are two theories. One is it goes on expanding at the rate at which it is, which means in a few million, billion years' time, every star will be a lonely star far removed from every other part of the universe, which will become so dark because every part will have been continue to travel or is there a gravitational pull at the at the hub of the universe that will reach a point at which it will start to to retract and everything will start to come back and the big question then that cosmologists ask is will time go backwards if that happens and will it all come back to a little to, to, to a big crunch you know the big bang becomes a big crunch and, and is it a bouncing universe they call you know bang crunch bang crunch bang crunch fascinating questions but the the thing is that instead of being lost in wonder over the beauty and vastness of it, we, we try to reduce it to a question of mathematics and scientific theory. And we lose the wonder. And I love the way Scripture speaks about the universe of wonder. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. So although we can't understand and comprehend and reduce it all to a simple little formula, there, there, is a, there is the fingerprints of God all across the vastness of our creation. And when you see how vast it is, you know how big God is. You need to get an idea. The sad fact is, is that familiarity breeds contempt. There's never been so much knowledge as there is today, and it's doubling every few years. And yet, there's never been such blaséness about what we know. Where's the child-eyed wonder at the greatness of God and the vastness of his creation? Scripture has some interesting things to say about wonder. Psalm 17 verse 7 says, Show the wonder of your great love. You know, we, we debate the doctrine of God's love, but do we bask in the wonder of it? You won't fit it into some comprehensible size. I love that occasion in Mark 9 when Jesus had been with Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. And when they came back and rejoined the other nine disciples, there was a crowd there, including some teachers of the law. And it says that the teachers of the law were arguing with them. And Jesus walked in on the crowd. And this is what it says. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. Have we lost that sense of wonder about Jesus? When we come on a Sunday morning to open the Word of God and to sing the praises of God, is there a spring in our step as we come? Is there an anticipation we're going to meet with God in a fresh way today? We're going to hear from God? Or has it just become old hat? It's just what we happen to do on Sunday morning. When the man was healed on the temple gate in Acts chapter 3, the crowd gathered very quickly. It says they recognized him as the man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Can I ask you, when were you last filled with wonder and amazement at things that God was doing? When were you last filled with wonder and amazement? Have you lost the wonder? You know, we can sit in a place like this and we can lose all sense of wonder and instead we become legalistic we're looking for dotted I's and cross T's we become cranky and we become critical these things by the way go together legalism, crankiness, critical spirit I think the greatest setback in many of our Christian lives is that we've, we're no longer astonished we're no longer amazed we're no longer filled with wonder at God and what God is doing Isaiah 29 writes about occasion the Lord said to him these people come near me with their mouth they honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me their worship of me is made of only of rules taught by men here's a dry predictable legalistic cold relationship with God the mouth says the right things the lips speak correctly but the hearts are far removed what's the antidote to that the next verse Isaiah 29 verse 14 therefore once more I will astound these people with wonder upon wonder the wisdom of the wise will perish, the intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. In other words, there won't be any answers. The intelligence is not the issue. The wisdom is not the issue. It's just wonder, wide-eyed wonder upon wonder 
that God says, I'll astound the people with. You childlike in wonder, I should become as a little child. Wouldn't it be great if we recaptured the wonder rather than trying to fit in all the little details? A childlike life, secondly, is a life of curiosity. Someone has said there's a point in a child's development when their mind is shaped like a question mark. Every question, every sentence seems to begin with the word why, or how, or who, or what. I heard about a father and his son one day walking along one night. Clear sky, it's dark. The son said to his father, Dad, how far away is the moon? The father said, I, I don't know, son. They walked on, and after a while, the son said, Dad, how many miles is it across the moon? Dad said, that's an interesting question, son, but I, I don't know. And they walked on in silence, and, and the son said, Dad, how far away is the nearest star? And the father said, you know, it's a very long way, I know that, but I don't actually know how far it is. And a few steps later, the son said, Dad, I hope you don't mind me asking you all these questions. And the dad said, not at all, son. You never learn anything if you don't ask questions. <laughs> you know, Mike Iaconelli in his book, Dangerous Wonder, says a very good thing about this. He says, when a child asks questions, it is not about finding answers. It's about building a relationship. That's why children ask questions. It's about building a relationship. I actually love the fact that there are things that we don't know. You know, the worst thing we can do is find the answer to everything. <laughs> you know, we Christians don't have the answer to, to a lot of things. We, we sometimes feel we've got to come up with an answer. But you know what Deuteronomy 29, 29 says? It says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever. There are certain things, he says, that belong to God. He has not revealed them to us. We don't know them. We don't, cannot be confident about them. There are certain things he has revealed that do belong to us. We need, yes, to be confident about the things that he has revealed, but we need to be cautious and humble about the things that have not been revealed to us. There's a book published in the 14th century, and, and I tried to trace this book on the internet this week, and, and it's still in existence. It's published. There's an American publisher who's republished it. I, I love it because of the title. It's called The Cloud of Unknowing. And the basic thesis of this book is in all the bits that we know, there's a cloud of unknowing. There are lots of things we don't know about God, about life. And a childlike life is a life of curiosity. Let's explore. Einstein was one of those brilliant minds of the 20th century. He was asked on one occasion, how much do you think you know? And Einstein said, I do not know 100th part of 1% about anything. Because actually people who know a lot know there's an awful lot more they don't know. These people who don't know very much are dogmatic about things that you can't be sure of. Let me suggest to a child life life, a childlike life is a life of risk. I mean, who goes who lines up to go on the roller coasters? It's kids, isn't it? I mean, does Canada's Wonderland have a seniors day? <laughs> Children need and enjoy risk. John Eldridge, in one of his books, writes about boys need to take risks. And they're going to be real boys and become men. Now we parents are very protective of our children, and rightly so. When my son Matthew got his dirt bike, I thought, boy, he's going to wrap this thing around a tree with him on it. But maybe one day he will, but let him ride it. He needs the fun and the risk and the joy that a young man needs of taking risk. As we grow old, we learn to play it safe. 
sometimes our Christian life, you see, when we stop being childlike, we, we start to play it safe. Uh, and our Christian life has been reduced to a comfortable set of beliefs about God rather than an adventurous encounter with God. We rate the Christian life on the ability to check the boxes and say, yes, I believe this, 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 this. But we know little of the adventurous encounter with a living God who takes us beyond where we've been before. On this question of risk, you ever notice that if you're a parent, you know you've got kids when they get to a certain age, you know, they save up their money. They'll get a job, they'll work all hours, they'll watch it come in, and when they have enough for something they want, they'll take it all out and spend it all on one thing. Your kids like that? And we say to ourselves, man, that's irresponsible, but anyway, you'll grow up. But you know, that's exactly what Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like. He said there was a man once who found treasure in a field. You know what he did? He did exactly what kids do. He sold everything he had and traded it in for this one thing. And in case the disciples didn't get the point, he said, and there was another man who was looking for pearls, and he found a pearl of great price. He went home, he sold everything he had, and he put it all in the one thing. He bought the pearl a great price. And you know, it's a willingness to risk everything for this one thing. You know, you can never live the Christian life till you're willing to give up everything for Christ and take risk. You'll have a dull, mundane Christian experience. You can't be very careful. I'm going to give to God. I'm going to put into world missions. Well, I can afford this amount, but there's no risk. C.T. Studd was a wealthy Englishman in the late 19th century and the first part of the 20th century. He was a great cricketer, played cricket for England. Some of you not sure what cricket is. It's a game that's played in the civilized world. And, and, and he, was a, he was a great cricketer. And then he was converted to the ministry of D.L. Moody and God called him to, to the mission field and he gave away, he had a lot of wealth, he gave it all away, except he kept back something like 10,000 pounds, which in those days was a lot of money for emergencies, he called it, as he was planning to get married. And he wanted to keep that just, to, you know, just in case. And he told his wife that he had kept back a little bit of money, given all the rest away just for when they got married. And she said to him, Charlie, that's what she called him, Charlie, it's the money or me. You don't marry me till every penny is gone. And they gave it all away. And if you read C.D. Sud's stories and you read his diary, he writes, I give you an example, he once wrote in his diary, funds are low again. This is when he was living in a tent, literally a tent in Central Africa in the Congo. He said, funds are low again. Hallelujah. This means God trusts us and is willing to leave his reputation in our hands. What a great spirit. A childlike life is a life of risk. A childlike life is a life of playfulness. You know, it's sad when we get too old to play, isn't it? You know, one of the great things about becoming a dad, and those of your dads probably know this, one of the things I enjoyed most about becoming a father is I could play again and not be embarrassed about playing with my kids. You could play silly games like hide and seek and lurky. You ever played lurky? Sardines. Kids liked it, but so did I. You see, it allows your imagination to grow, to enjoy fantasy, enjoy dreams. When I was a little kid, only about six, with my friend, we, we, we made spacecraft. We dug a hole in the, in the dirt in the field outside my house. And we had a, made, a, made one each, made a place to seat, sit, made a little hole behind us. We put down some plastic lining and we filled it with water and we punched just little holes in the plastic so the water would leak out. This was fuel, this was our spacecraft. We actually called them waters, I remember. Uh, and we would travel the universe in these little things. He'd be over there, I'd be here. You know, where are you now? We'd make up names of places. We'd get some intergalactic interference once in a while and we'd land back again on Earth. And we'd go out at night and we'd say, that's where I'm going to go tomorrow. And we'd look at some distant part of the universe. I'm going to stop on that. I'm going to stop on that uh, star to get some milk because I'll be thirsty by then. I'm going to go on over here. 
It's great to be playful, have an imagination. It's where vision comes, it's where dreams come. You know, God loves play, did you know that? Here's a vision that God gives in Zechariah chapter 8 of when all the Jews will come back after their exile to, is, to Jerusalem. And one of the things he says about the city of Jerusalem is in verse 5 of Zechariah 8. The city streets will be filled with boys and girls playing there. This is what the Lord God Almighty says. It may seem marvelous to the remnant of the people at that time, but will it seem marvelous to me, declares the Lord Almighty. When I read that this week, I thought, oh boy, it's going to say no later on. I'll spoil this point for the message. But I read the rest of the chapter. And, and God says, yes, it will be marvelous to me to see the children, the boys and the girls, playing in the street. You know, the Christian life, life should be fun. That doesn't mean superficial. It doesn't mean you don't care about important things. But playfulness. I've been corresponding with somebody by email recently, and at the bottom of their email, they have, you know, permanently there, every time after they've signed their name, they have this little statement. I love it. It says, work like you don't need the money. Love like you've never been hurt. And dance like you do when no one is watching. Isn't that great? Work like you don't need the money. Just enjoy it. Love like you've never been hurt. And dance like you do when no one is watching. But I love it. That's someone unafraid to play. And I know, who wrote, I know the person who has that. They've got lots to be hurt about. But they say, no, no. Work like you don't need the money. Love like you've not been hurt. Dance like you do when no one's watching. Childlike life is a life of trust. This is the key component here, really, in verse 18, in chapter 18. You know, whoever humbles himself like this child. You know, we believe that we grow from dependence to independence. Physically, we do. But, you know, spiritually, we grow from independence to dependence. And maturity is dependence in the Christian life. It's one of the great qualities in the child. I've been in the Watoto villages in Uganda. I've been in the neighboring villages too, where the look on the faces of the children is so very different. Strained, fearful, keep that distance. And you walk into the Watoto village, and the kids don't know you. When I first went there, they didn't know me from any, anybody. Yet they'd run, grab you by the hand, two, three to each hand come and see this come and let me show you my room they trust the trust of a child is a very wonderful thing I know we have to protect our children in a wicked world but let's recapture childlikeness these disciples arguing who's the greatest having a dispute who's the greatest they probably had a checklist, the kind of checklist we would have. But the checklist of Jesus is so totally different. And we need to learn to recapture the wonder, to recapture curiosity, to recapture risk, to recapture playfulness, to recapture trust. And that's why Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you change. Because everything in us actually doesn't want to be like that. We think we've got to be mature in a way which rules these things out of our lives. We've got to become independent, which rules dependence out. We've got to become self-sufficient, that rules out trust. And in the following verses, which we're going to look at next time, we're going to look then, going back to this text, that four things that Jesus says have to change. It won't happen just by saying, well, that was nice. You go home this morning, yeah, I like that. It was refreshing. I like the ideas. But unless you change, what has to change? How does it change? We'll find out. The spirit of greatness in the kingdom of heaven is growing up into a child. Child, not childish, childlike.